Welcome to the Legacy Centre of Excellence here in Birmingham. It's three months to the day since the Commonwealth Games closed in the city. And uh, welcome also to our online audience who are joining us uh, via Zoom this morning. Uh, my name's Simon Lansley. I work with the core team of the coalition, along with my colleagues uh, Kelly and Hitesh. And you'll be hearing from them a little bit later on. And we've also got Erin, who's uh, conducting matters um, online. Uh, so a brief uh, mention what the coalition, some of you may be more aware than others. It's a growing national movement of organizations using uh, sport, intentionally using sport and physical activity to generate positive social uh, outcomes. Um, those outcomes um, are reflected here on the Open Goal Framework and many of you in the organizations you work with will be familiar with some of these, whether that's improving mental health and well-being, closing the gap in education development, uh, to reducing crime and social behavior. But the reason we call it Open Goal is because of the value that one intervention in one of those areas also is being created in other areas. So the multiple returns on investment. And long term, uh, we believe that this is a, a way of saving public money. And that's what we want to say to government, that this is an open goal. So I'd really appreciate if you, those of you on social media today and beyond to use the open goal hashtag and help, help let's uh, keep momentum going. Uh, a couple of housekeeping matters. You, you'll have seen the toilets on the way in, hopefully. There's fire exits behind me and to the, uh, over there. Um, there isn't a fire drill planned, um, but if you do hear it, please make your way out in an orderly way. Uh, fashion. We'll be going through for two hours. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds though because the second half of it we're going to be answering some questions you can see on the wall around you uh, in breakout rooms and we'll also be doing that um, online in breakout rooms. So um, and I just want to say before we kick off a final thank you to uh, Jeff Thompson and Janice from Youth Charter who've been a fantastic help in arranging uh, this event, and also to Keith, the CEO of the Legacy Centre, and Janky. Where's Janky gone? I don't know where she's gone, but she's been amazing in the build-up, so thank you very much, Janky. Um, um, a little bit about, a final bit about the agenda today. As I said, the second half, we're going to be moving around the room and on the online breakout sessions. Before that, we've got two panel sessions uh, focusing on policy and practice. We've got some amazing local organisations who are going to be talking and thinking about uh, the contribution of sport for development to create an impactful legacy. Uh, before then, we've got three keynote speakers. Um, Mark Laurie from Street Games is going to be setting the policy context. And we've got Tom Clark Forrest from Sport for Life, which, if you don't know, is an amazing uh, sport and employ employability organization based across the West Midlands. And he's going to be talking about the practice context. But before we start, I'd just like to introduce uh, Beverly Mason who is Senior Independent Director and Co-Founder of Sporting Equals. So thank you very much. Hope you have a good event. Thank you, Simon. Um, welcome to the town hall meeting. Um, I must admit, I'm really happy to be here today. This is my hometown. I've not lived in Birmingham for a long time, so forgive me. I'm kind of, I feel like a visitor at the moment. Um, thanks to the Sports for Development Coalition, the Legacy of Excellence, and in particular, Youth Charter. And I really want to give thanks uh, for Jeff Thompson for inviting me to take part in this uh, process today. It's really very critical that as uh, an organization that serves its community that we're part of the conversation moving forward. Um, as um, uh, Simon has just said, we'll be hearing from Mark Lowry and, and, Tom, and Tom Clark uh, Forrest in a few moments. We have a very rich and full program which we'll hear, which we'll hear from you. You're the individuals who matter today. Um, you've worked very hard to support to, and to con contribute towards community sports in this city and beyond. And we're going to talk about lasting impact and change. And of course, the focus is really around what kind of legacy do we feel that large impact games can have? Do they have an impact? So I'm looking forward to celebrating successes with you and to share stories of our experiences of the Commonwealth Games. I'm actually really grateful to our host here. Uh, thanks to Keith, uh, for the CEO, the CEO of the Legacy for Centre of Excellence. Being in this building symbolizes for me the renewal of a vision 
for the community. It was not too long ago that this vision for a local centre for the arts and excellence was shattered by political and financial disruptions, only to re-emerge um, under a transformational vision. This has taken a Herculean effort. Let's make no bones about this. And no doubt it still requires some wrangling. So this center where we're sitting today is actually a really good symbol of an intentional plan, a purpose to create a successful venture for the community. We cannot breeze past why we're here today. It's an important, it's a, it's an important location and an important space in terms of heritage for the communities in Birmingham. So my name is Beverly Mason. I'm a founding trustee of Sporting Equals. Uh, Sporting Equals started out as a, a project within the Commission for Racial Equality funded by Sport England back in 1998. It was a project, but it turned from being a project in being, into being a, a not-for-profit organization based on the fact that in, there was an investment, an investment budget to really ensure that communities were able to get engaged in sports. Our mission is around equity and diversity, but our, our, our kind of real core purpose is to eradicate racism in sport. We started this process in 1998. We're still at it, and it's not over yet. So I think today is an example of where we can perhaps, you know, share experiences of, our, of, of difference, differences that we've experienced on an individual basis, on a community basis, and also where we're trying to access resources and tell the story about the impact, that we're, the difference that we're making in our own communities through engagement, through the power of sport. Let's talk about collaboration. We have found at Sporting Equals that collaborating has to be, and I use this word again, intentional, but it also has to be equitable. It has to be served with realness, and not being getting twisted out of shape by chasing funding that might be made available in, at moments of world, world events. I think most of you know what I'm talking about when I say that. You know, we at Sport and Equal still have the, the mission to eradicate racism in sport, but also we want to evaluate the landscape by providing evidence of the difference and change that we're making um, and for providing participation opportunities for ethically diverse, diverse communities. So why are we here today? It's the 8th of November. And apart from this being my ex-mother-in-law's birthday, uh, say no more. This, is, this used to be a, a venue for comedy, but this is another matter. We'll, we'll come to that later. It's all, I'm also reminded, um, funnily enough, it's today, today's the day uh, that Nigel Mansell um, crashed out of the Australian Grand Prix in Adelaide, but he still took the World Championship. So what I'm trying to say by using this metaphor is that we might be on the road to success, but sometimes there are barriers that just hit us straight, you know, straight in the face, knock us back. But we have to keep continuing. But we have to have a dialogue with each other. And that dialogue has to be with different voices, with open ears and frank and open discussion. Um, you know, I come from the heritage sector um, and the arts, so I have to tell stories, I'm afraid. So you've got me for a few more minutes. Um, does anybody remember the American singer, Johnny Nash? Uh, his famous song was, I Can See Clearly Now. It reached number one on the, on the 8th of November in 1972. The lyrics to that song really do feel relevant for today. I can see clearly now. Talking about blue skies, talking about opportunities, talking about the way that we might want to envisage our future. But if you look at blue skies, there always can be a silver lining behind a cloud. How do we disperse clouds? We blow them away. How do we blow them away? We blow them with some sort of power or energy. So the energy in this room, it will help us to make change and difference. I'm also really happy to know that uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking together in groups around the table using a kind of a, a technology, if you like, that was invented uh, by Walter Rodney, a scholar activist um, from, actually he's from Guyana um, and studied here in the, in the UK. Um, he had a simple thing, use cultural context, use technical information, use people's voices to tell stories 
and to share experiences because they are all valid. There is not one version of history. There are many versions of history. And Walter Rodney was assassinated for his views. People didn't like what he was saying. Uh, but he did write a seminal book uh, which, which kind of exposed uh, racism in institutions. And his book is called How Europe underdeveloped Africa, and I do recommend that you read that book. It's really important for, for understanding how communities feel about their, their time in the UK and, and other places. So let's go back to Johnny Nash. His album, I Can See Clearly Now, also had um, a, a really good song, which nobody else remembers, but forgive me, I, I do. Um, it was a song called There Are More Questions Than Answers. There are more questions than answers. Of course there are more questions. We don't have all the answers. And the only way we can get to finding the answers is to ha have this feeling of being listened to and being heard and understood, no matter where we come from, no matter what, where we are in our journey. And I think that um, today is about reaching out and talking to each other. So this town hall is a step forward. Um, last week... I had the privilege of interviewing Middlesex cricketer Naomi Zatali. Some of you were in the audience, I think, at the House of Commons last week. It was um, a celebration event for the Spirit of 2012 Breaking Boundaries Legacy Partnership uh, with youth, youth sports trusts and sporting equals. Naomi lives by this quote, and I have to say, I, I just want to say it because it really it chimes with me, and I hope that it chimes with you, and I hope it has a relevance for what we're trying to do today. The quote comes from a, a philosopher called Alexander Dendasia. He says, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So let's, let's just think about that for a second. With concerted pressure, we are the change. We are the fixers. So today is, is about making a focused effort to make sure that the legacy of major events like the Commonwealth Games has reach, has an impact, and makes a difference deep into and across communities. It's our opportunity for all of us to have an open, as I said earlier, a frank discussion about equity, but also to be really honest about the power dynamics of the how and the where the contributions of community sports organizations and sports development, where those land. You know, example of, after example, we've seen that sustainable divestments in community projects do work. Here we are, Sporting Equals, we've been going for 17 years as an independent charity. We were invested in, and we invested that work into, into communities. One of our projects, Breaking Boundaries, led by Shahinjid in the audience today, uh, pr proves that if you're building legacy from the outset, you can plan for the future at the very beginning, and not only develop communities, but also young voices, young leaders. They're the future. So let's place the future firmly in their hands. I want to give a shout out to um, our CEO, Aaron Kang. He's not here today, but he's gone on over the last 17 years to develop a number of inclusive projects, including a network of 5,000 members, producing crucially impactful resources and tools that directly serve ethnically diverse communities. And he's helped with our support to change the, the face of sports leadership. It's a long race, and I was just joking with Andy earlier on before we, we came up to the stage. You know, this is a long race, not a marathon. It's more like a steeplechase, isn't it? There are barriers, and it's, it's an endurance game, but you have to kind of be, be very strategic with how you run the race. But I have to say, we do want to encourage transformation in people's life outcomes. That's what we're about, and that's what I think the sports for coalition development and for community sports for development is all about. I can't finish off, I can't leave without saying something about the power of the arts, I have to say. I think, you know, we're all integrated people. None of us are only sports people or interested in the arts or interested in the education. All of these factors make part of our lives and our communities. So let's think about organizations who, who can be part of the coalition that you know of, individuals who have a, a particular leadership skill or particular strength or a voice in their community. Bring those people in because they have something to increase the practice, not only the policy, but the practice of the success of in trying to in, in bring investment into, into the communities themselves. They have the voices. And I think that Simon talked about the open goal framework, which has been co-designed by the coalition members. 
It has to be equal voices um, at the table. I think I've said enough now, and I think I need to move forward. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the two other keynote speakers this morning, um, starting with Mark Lowry, who's the chief executive of the National Sports of Development charity, Street Games. Mark is very well known in the sector and will speak first and will set the, the, the policy context for the sessions that are coming up later on this morning. After Mark, and I've just met Mark for the first time, um, Tom for the first time today, can't believe we've not met before, Tom. How is that? <laughs> Uh, Tom Clark Forrest, the CEO of the West Midlands-based charity for Sport for Life, who are doing really amazing work, I'm here, across the region, will pro provide the, back, the backbone, the perspective of practitioners on the ground across the region. After their keynotes, uh, there'll be two policy and practice panel sessions, which Simon will, pro will provide a briefing for later on. In the meantime, first off is Mark. I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Beverly. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm always worried about stairs. You know, you've got that moment where you can fall flat on your face this early on in the day. That would not be a good start. Hello to those of you online as well. Um, if you can't see that clearly because the camera's not that great, I'm the one that looks a little bit like Tom Cruise or George Clooney. Those of you who are uh, further forward will know that I'm telling a terrible lie. Um, Birmingham is a really special city for me. Um, while Beverly was talking, I was just reflecting, I, um, 27 years ago now, I did my teacher training here. And when we started to get involved as a charity in the holiday activities work in the city about two or three years ago, the first meeting I went to with the city council, I, I talked about four young people. And their names were Zulfa, Shamila, Hani, and Jerome. And they were four children who were in my class at Balsall Heath Primary School in Birmingham. And they had nothing. And I mean that quite sincerely. Their parents had so little money and such large families that they really had nothing. I remember doing science lessons with them where they used to be impressed by a cotton reel with a safety pin on the end for doing weights and measures because no one had sat with them at home and played with the most basic things in their house because they, they just didn't have them. And the thing that I most remember about Bussell Heath is that actually sport, and in their case, cricket, really gave them something. Because those of you who know the geography of the city well will know that less than a mile down the road is Edgebaston Cricket Ground. And Warwickshire used to come into school, the school had no grass area, and they used to play cricket. And the kids who went to that school, cricket was the thing that lifted them up. And it made such a difference to them. Now, the reason for sharing that has nothing to do with the policy context, but actually sometimes I, I think, and particularly for us as an organization, the point of the policy context is to make the difference to Shamila, to Hani, to Zulfo, and to Jerome. And now, because it's 27 years on, it's their children, may even be their grandchildren in some cases, that are now in the city. And it's still as challenging, I think, then, now as it is then. And the other thing from this year is that in May, we brought our board to Birmingham. Some of them had never been to the city before, but what we did was we took them out and we visited some of the brilliant local organizations around the city. And we went to one in Handsworth. And this particular organization had somehow managed to talk a very nice grammar school into giving their immaculate pitch in the middle of Handsworth, surrounded by big fencing, to be used for their football sessions. And while we were there, one of my board members said, what's that over there? I said, I think that's the floodlights at Perry Bar. I think that's the stadium. And so there we were, less than half a mile from the stadium. And the conversation we were having was about how included are these young people? They can see the lights. When the games are on, they'll no doubt see the traffic, people heading to the games. How included do they feel in a games that is for them? So for me, the word legacy, which is used so much, I think the choice of the word impact really matters, and also the choice of the word inclusion. So to talk very briefly about the policy context, 
any one of a number of people in this room could be doing this, so I apologise. I'm looking around at some of the more, most experienced sports professionals I know, certainly in my working life, but I got the gig, so I apologise if you don't agree, and this is the start of the debate. Usually, major events in this country, when you start, if you start before 2012, but let's start with 2012, the opening gambit about legacy has been about economic development. It's been about how much money can be generated by having a major sporting event in our country. And the second thing that has then been talked about through many of the major events, this is true of Glasgow, it's true of the Olympics, it's slightly less true of Birmingham because the further we go through, the less we build new stadium. Stadia is about regeneration. It's about taking areas that have maybe been left behind and improving those local areas for local people. And then the third thing that somehow gets mentioned at the end a little bit is, oh, what about participation? What about sport? What about the difference that sport can make? And we know from the young people that we work with that in terms of spectating at major events, they're 50% less likely, if you're from the poorest families or groups in society, you are 50% less likely to have seen a major sporting event than those who are from the most affluent. So actually the access to being included and, and seeing these major sporting events from a policy perspective just is not there. And then the thing that often preoccupies governments time after time is obviously the, the public health aspect of these events and the opportunity where you are working in communities that, that have real challenges with obesity, with cancer, with type 2 diabetes, to improve the physical and mental well-being of communities and of young people. And we did some work back around 2012 with Canterbury Christchurch University just looking at what they called the festival effect and the demonstration effect, which were all about how do you actually increase physical activity levels on the basis of using the moments that are created by major sporting events. So I remember really clearly in 2012 that Seb Coe stood up and he said quite honestly, he said, there isn't much money for legacy. He said, you need to make of legacy, this was in a room of governing bodies of other sports organizations, you need to make of legacy what you will. You need to make the most of the legacy. And I still believe that to be true, because even though there was money invested around Birmingham and around the games, actually it's about every organization that wants to make a difference about legacy. And Sir Keith Mills, the vice chairman of London 2012, talked about legacy not as an opportunity to create lots of new policy angles, lots of new activities, but actually to turbocharge our existing efforts. While the lights of the world, when we're talking about major multi-sporting events, are on sport and are on the communities that we're all concerned about, it's an opportunity not necessarily to do different, but to do more of what works, to make more of a difference in the communities that we all serve. So then government's policy priorities around legacy for major events are one thing. But when I talk to local community organizations, they talk about different things. They talk about cohesion and connecting the people who live in their neighborhoods. They talk about legacy as an opportunity to re reduce crime and antisocial behavior by providing activities that not just divert young people, we're past that now, but support them and mentor them and help them find a positive path. They talk about the importance of skills and employability and the commissioner launching a report today about employability and that, that is very real as a part of what legacy is about. And from the point of view of young people who may, may live in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, we talk about broadening their horizons. They often live their lives within a one mile subjective neighborhood. They go to school, they go to the shop, they go to the park, they may go to their youth club if it still exists. But actually these major events offer a key opportunity to broaden horizons and improve mental health. 
I'm going to share some images just very quickly. I haven't seen the red card yet, Simon. How am I doing? Um, We, we were really lucky, this isn't about street games, but this is about young people and broadening their horizons. We had 500 young people come from around the UK to Birmingham in the summer to camp in a place called Blackwell Adventure, just outside the city. And for those young people, some of them were 18 and they never left their local area. And so major events offer that opportunity to take young people out of the space they're in and see a broader bit of the world. Meeting other young people from other parts of the country. If you never go further than a mile from your house, you've certainly never met somebody from South Wales if you're from West Bromwich. This, for me, is one of the most important parts of legacy because we know from the work we did around Glasgow that young people who come and get involved in major events, when they go back to their communities as young leaders, they are twice as motivated to do more, to set up more sessions, to make more activity available for their younger peers. Where am I pointing this at? Son? It doesn't, ah. And as I said before, why shouldn't young people with no money see what we see? Those of us who were fortunate, I, I went to the athletics one day after an event in Birmingham. But young people with no money should see these things. They inspire them. Like we talked about Inspire a Generation for London 2012. We talked about the games for everyone in Birmingham. Being able to be there really matters to the individual legacy for individual young people. And one of the brilliant things this summer, and this wasn't by any means just us, all the active partnerships in the region, lots of other partners, Canal and Rivers Trust, it became a catalyst for young people to take action in their communities. So much of the time we hear about civil society and the importance of developing social action and social capital. Well, this is real. This was young people who, inspired by Birmingham 2022, went and did things in their community from a sports perspective that made a difference. And the final thing is, for a lot of young people, it's the first time they'll have seen some of these sports. When we take it for granted, Sevens Rugby was introduced at Glasgow the first time in the Commonwealth Games. But actually, for some young people, apart from maybe at school if they can get into their PE lessons, they won't have had the opportunity to try these different sports. So it's not just for me about the policy context. It is about that policy context being translated locally. And we sometimes try and measure things at a macro, how many million more people have we got involved in sport as a result of the Commonwealth Games? Well, actually, for every young person, that had a positive experience that has turned them on to being involved in sport, either playing or as a volunteer or as a leader, that creation of opportunity in and of itself has value for every young person and every family involved. Just a final thought to finish on. I, internally within my organization, when we sat last year, this month last year, planning forward for 2022, we did not have a single penny to spend on the legacy work in Birmingham. We didn't. My finance director was all over me about, we can't do this, we haven't got any money. But actually, you can find it if you want to find it, and if you're prepared to fight for it because it matters to the young people or the families or the communities, then there are enough policy connectors and enough routes to make sure that we can all resource a legacy that will make a lasting difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was marvellous. And um, I was listening to you and I was reflecting upon the fact that when I lived in Birmingham, I lived, I lived here for my first 18 years, I only really sort of stuck to my local area, you know, between Handsworth and Spring Hill and, and Edgbaston, Ladywood. And I couldn't map, I was saying to my daughter just the other day, I, I couldn't map where places were in Birmingham. When I went to London, 
because of the, the London tube map, I knew exactly where things were. So that, that restriction is something that we all um, don't really always experience if we're coming from a different sort of community. Anyway, I'd love to invite um, Tom now, um, Tom Clark, for us to come up to the stage. And let's hear a round of applause for Tom. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's really fantastic to be here. It's great to see some familiar faces as well as a lot of new faces. And apologies to anyone from Manchester when I say this, but welcome to the official second city. Um, although I'm not sure we can say that for the football teams. Um, yeah, over the next eight minutes or so, I want to just share Sport for Life's journey of growth through impact and evidence-led impact as a direct delivery organization. I think that's really important um, in enabling us as a sector to articulate a clear solution when a window of opportunity like Birmingham 2022 presents itself. But before I get onto that, just a little bit more about us as an organization. So we are a sport for employment charity. We work with 11 to 29 year olds. We deliver structured one-to-one -one mentoring as our core service and combine that with sport and physical activity, accredited qualifications and employability workshops to support young people towards uh, education and employment outcomes. We are based here in Birmingham, operate across the West Midlands. We work with about 2,000 young people meaningfully and intensively each year. And we use sport in two key ways. Firstly, as an engagement tool to recruit young people into our services, but also as a vehicle and a conduit to directly and indirectly move people towards tangible outcomes and towards better futures. A bit about our work with the coalition. We've worked with the coalition for a few years now, most notably contributing to their employability and well-being working groups. And in terms of the open goal framework, obviously our work with employment means we're working uh, much more intensively on the increased employability and skills theme. But we know young people benefit from multiple returns and given our work on well-being as well, um, young people are being supported in that area. Just a little bit on the Commonwealth Games, those 11 amazing days when they were here for us, we were united by partner and we had the opportunity to take 80 young people to attend games, spectate at the games. We supported young people into jobs and volunteering opportunities during those 11 days. We also had a number of baton bearers um, from really deserving young people and volunteers. And we delivered on and continue to deliver on a number of employability initiatives that came from those games. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, impact. As I said, it's really important. Now, I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room or anyone listening of the power of sport in improving and changing lives is something that a lot of us live and breathe day in, day out, 365 days a year. But I think there probably are those outside of the sector, outside of sport, and dare I say outside our echo chamber at times that do need convincing. And so I think it's incumbent on us to articulate that change we're making, evidence that impact, so we can take that to commissioners, to funders, to government, to try and make that difference. And uh, for us, we've on a been on a really interesting journey with impact. First and foremost, that started with a cultural shift. So we wanted to become data-led and evidence-led and youth-led in everything that we do. So really seeking to understand the difference we make and trying to understand what works, what doesn't work, and being really open and honest when it doesn't work and to move towards creating reliable, valid, and evidence-led data. So for us, that started with articulating our theory of change. So why do we do what we do? Why do we deliver specific activities? How do they lead to short-term and long-term outcomes? And once we've done that, we could then really define our monitoring and evaluation and data collection processes 
and really create tangible outcomes and clear impact reports. And like many people probably here today, we've had that challenge of trying to articulate hard outcomes versus soft outcomes. So for us, a lot of our outcomes, getting young people into sustained employment, getting a young person into a qualification, that's a little bit more binary, a bit more black and white. We can quite clearly evidence that through a certificate, a payslip, a job offer letter, for example. Um, so when we say to funders and commissioners that we supported 460 young people into a social action project, when we say 165 young people gained an accredited qualification, we can really prove that and evidence that. And on softer outcomes, a little bit more intangible, perhaps a bit more subjective, difficult to measure, we really strive to use industry standard tools and frameworks like Outcome Star, like WemWebs, to evidence changes in life skills and uh, well being changes. And I think that impact approach has key external and internal benefits for us as an organization. So externally, we can take clear evidence to showcase to funders, commissioners, the difference we're making to gain reinvestment, to gain new investment. That's a theme we've seen. But also, perhaps a little bit more under the radar is helping internally. So how can your data help you to improve and develop what you do, improve our model, make changes as a result of what the evidence is telling us? And that's something we've seen a trend on uh, over the years. And when we think of the social health and well-being benefits that major sports events can achieve and that our sector achieves, as I said, Birmingham 2022 offers a real opportunity to sustain that impact once the athletes and the media have left. And that's why I think we need to record and evidence that impact both individually as organizations and wider as a sector and a coalition to create a compelling case with clear returns on investment and savings to civil society to take to government departments and agencies. And just to round it all off, as it happens, we have a very real life example of that today. So the coalition this week during National Youth Week are launching a new report called Active for Employment, led by the University of Bath and other partners. And crucially, and hopefully this links to what I've been saying, this report wouldn't have been possible without submission and evidence from 50 direct delivery organizations throughout the country that have led to clear recommendations that we as a coalition can take to government agencies and departments. And so hopefully this process of evidencing the change we're making, creating compelling reports like this can ensure we keep knocking on the door, keep banging the drum, and try and increase investment in sport. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was really a, a, an excellent kind of an example of, of how we as professionals in the sports sector know what we need to do. And we, we, we work with evidence, we work with storytelling. But I would, I would encourage you all today um, in your conversations to be a little bit maverick, be a bit renegade, you know, be a little bit more kind of activist in thinking about the changes that you can make. I think that innovation in our thinking is really important at this point. You know, we do look to government for policy changes, for support for the sector, but we can also start to think beyond the government and think about where else can that, this support be gathered from within the community, from within businesses. Let's think cross-culturally cross about where this, this support can come and therefore it becomes a more embedded, sustainable legacy that we create. And then as I said earlier on, you have to plan for legacy. Um, coming after the fact is possible and Mark gave a really good example. You can find the money, but it's about the thinking, it's the, in it's the intentionality of it all. So I just encourage people to share their intentions because I know the intentions are in the room, to share those, share those intentions intentions and to share the solutions as well. I'm going to hand over to Simon now who's going to take us to the next session and give us a briefing for the, new, the, the two sessions which will we'll talk through policy and practice. Thank you Simon. Thanks Beverly um, and thanks Mark and Tom, uh, really brilliant interventions. Um, I'd like to uh, 
invite up to the stage now. We've got um, a panel discussion which is focused on local practitioners. Um, so I'm really excited about three brilliant organizations. We've got Nassim from the uh, Sahili Hub, and she's leaving the country tomorrow. So thank you, Nassim, uh, for uh, helping today. Dan Allen from Sports Key. Where are you, Dan? He's got the tracky top on. Good man. And uh, Kurt Dawes from Birmingham Rockets. And I haven't seen Kurt yet, so good stuff. But we had a great chat the other day. So Jen from Street Games, if you'd like to, you guys would like to come up and take your place on the stage. We've got about 10, 15 minutes of this, and then we've got another panel which is going to focus on the policy end before we move into the breakout sessions. So... There we go. Hi, Kurt. Nice to see you. Morning, everybody. Lovely to be here with you all. Uh, lots of friendly faces in the room. Um, I'm Jen Carter from Street Games. I've been working in the region now for about five years or so, um, in the last couple of years, predominantly in Birmingham on the holiday activities and food program. Um, so great to be here. Great to be with such a fine caliber of panelists this morning. Hopefully, we'll make it as painless as possible for you all. Um, so just to break us in, I'd like to hear a little bit about who you are, which organization you're from, and whereabouts in the region you're from. My name's Kirk Dawes. I am from Birmingham Rockets. I chair the board at Birmingham Rockets. Um, it's from Shakespeare, as you like it, Seven Ages of Man. So I'm at that one age before the last bit, so this is my blanket. <laughs> what I will say is this. City of Birmingham Rockets is a basketball club. It is the biggest basketball club in this country. We have 1,200 youngsters that are part of the, uh, the club. We have 300 who play nationally. So all those kids that are in those communities outside get to travel the whole, whole country on a weekly basis. We have a lot of volunteers. We're involved in things like Europod, where we send kids abroad. The last one was uh, uh, a uh, number of girls who went to uh, Lyon, and we have people who have to come back. We're involved in Erasmus. Erasmus, quite simply, with Sweden, Bulgaria, Spain, and indeed ourselves. And throughout the year, we send teams Oh, squads over there and they come back to us. In terms of um, what I will say is that my, in my previous life I was a cop and I was a cop at probably the worst time in terms of violence in this city. The biggest thing about that is this. It's about, it is about economics and I'll tell you what it is. For a small investment in sport, right, it will save the public purse a lot and I will tell you that because the club that I'm at since 2003 we have had three kids in the criminal justice system, and I will say we have had well over 10,000 kids at that club. And when I say the cost of a murder, back in the day when I was really involved in what was taking place in the city, in comparison to some of the interventions, 2.7 million, and for mediation, which is what I was responsible for, three and a half grand. Sport is massively important to this city. Challenges, I'll tell you. It is about funding it. Most of the kids that we get come from the inner city. They haven't got the money to pay for subs and the like, or to go abroad or to go anywhere else. And we provide bursaries and all sorts of things, international camps, and send them away as well. We do have some serious challenges at the club because we've got to run it. Facility costs in the UK are way up there, but we have to find it day in, day out. Legacy from the games, I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm still waiting to see what that will be, yeah? I'm not a renegade, I don't want to blow anybody up, but I will say this, we provided a load of kids when it was asked for on the, you know, like the year to go and the like, equipment, kids and coaches and the like, on a number of occasions for these games. But when it came to anything to do with the games, we didn't receive one ticket. And the biggest thing about that is, well, sorry, we did from one of the board members' organisations, Scowlings, a law firm in this, in this city. They were the only ones, 20. So we're waiting to see. We're willing to work with, uh, you know, with, you know, coalition and obviously with youth charter to get, get it right. But, you know, it's all about reciprocity. If you give, then people should learn that they've got to give back to. That's all I will say. Thank you. Brilliant. Afternoon all, 
wish I would have went first, so I could have set the bar low. Thank you, Kirk. Um, my name is... My name is Daniel Allen and I'm the director of a community-based organisation called Sportski. Sportski is based here in Birmingham. Ultimately, we utilise a range of sport, physical activity and culture to really try and get the community active in many different ways. So currently we have a suite of different activities we run in the community from recreational football to netball to boxing to cycling to buggy runs. I've probably missed some, but we ultimately really try and think of ways that we can try and remove some of the life stuff for people. Um, so we provide all the equipment, we provide childcare when necessary. I'm not referring to anyone's kids as being stuffed, by the way, just to, um, to make that clear. Um, so we really try and take a centered person approach to what surrounds people's lives in our community, especially young people, and how we can help them engage, essentially. We um, have a volunteer program, so we're trying to get more young people to volunteer with routes to employment. So with that, we take young people on a range of different experiences from national governing body qualifications, experiences like social away days, and put them through employability programs. And, and yeah, that project's going from strength to strength. And I suppose we've really tried to under-promise but over-deliver with that program by selecting 10 young people and really taking them through a, a quite a robust pathway in terms of their volunteer to employment experience. We run events, so we try and run a lot of cultural events linking sport and culture throughout the year. And we also have developed what's called we call a community of practice, which essentially we're working with organisations and groups who are far detached from the system and ultimately trying to go through a journey of organisational development with those organisations. So that's really coming to fruition nicely. Um, and yeah, we sort of operate in sort of northwest Birmingham, typically in areas such as Aston, Perry Bar, Handsworth, Newtown, Neutrals. And we are quite agile and flexible as an organisation. We go around using various different leisure sites and sports halls. And yeah, just really try and be prominent in the community, getting people active and using sport as a tool in different ways. Have I missed anything, Jen? No? no? Great, thanks, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Nassim Akhtar. I'm, um, I came here when I was one. I've lived most of my life in Borsa Heath, and I'm very proud. B12 all the way. Um, uh, uh, Sailing Hub was set up in 1998. Um, we're about 23 years old, so to speak. What we really do is work and prioritise working with women in the inner city. We work with about 3,500 women across all our programmes. Um, we now operate in three wellbeing centres, four GP surgeries, four parks. We work with women because uh, when I was growing up, you went to school and you went home, then you went home and you went to school, then you went home and went to school. There was no other option or activity uh, in my neighbourhood. So now... Um, our youngest um, participant is 14. Our eldest is 86, who learned how to ride a bike at 83. Um, she's 86 years young. I should point that out. That's how she tells me. Um, and what we really do is give women opportunities and chances to be who they want to be. We use the medium of sport to change women's lives every single day. So we do things like um, rock climbing, skiing, canoeing, biking, quad biking for young girls. But we uh, concentrate on working women who are... 14 plus and we work on programs such as walk jog runs 5k's half marathons full marathons we do things like swimming um, aerobics exercise zumba indoor outdoor cycling from learn to ride to long lead rides and we take part in events like the velo ride um, the half marathons the 10k's and we then take women to travel to some of these events across the city because most events we do we usually are the only ethnic minority slash Asian women at events and so we try and break that barrier that's our main kind of um, daily and the biggest thing we now do is work with GPs on a social prescribing program too and we've always done this since 2006 when we opened our first site for with half a million for Sport England which is we help women manage their long-term conditions so whether it's um, diabetes um, it's obesity it's weight management it's um, getting out the house domestic violence you name it we deal with it Thanks all and a great start. Um, sharing the mic between you, I just want to now kind of dig a bit deeper in terms of what impact do you feel that the Commonwealth Games has had on your organisation and your beneficiaries? <laughs> I think I've said to you what I think the impact has been so far. Of course, we're willing to work. I mean, we've got 47 different languages within the club. And uh, we have, you know, boys to men, girls to women. 
And in terms of impact, all I will say is that we're willing to work with anybody, but I have to be really honest with it. It's like I swear before, Martin God, you know, that stuff that I used to do. I just got to tell the truth. We're waiting to see what it will be, but we're willing to work. So if we'd approach, we, we speak to a lot to Sport Birmingham who really do support us and the like. But from the, from the Commonwealth Games Committee, other than Jeff Thompson, I'm still waiting to see. And I'll just be honest about it, it won't be rude, but I've got to tell it like it is. Oh. Yeah, um, on, on a positive front, um, and then probably going to the critical front uh, thereafter, um, we were fortunate enough to be selected by Gen 22 as part of a legacy program. Um, so that really enabled us to add an extra layer of support to the organisation, particularly around our young people and our volunteer program. So that essentially allowed us to provide them with more national governing body qualifications, allowed us to employ a part-time volunteer coordinator to look after and manage the young people a lot more, um, enabled us to take the young people on more social away days, more experiences that they'd never had previously, um, and it effectively enabled us to then deploy these young people who have immersed themselves into this volunteer program and gained all these experiences and deploy them within our sessions. So ultimately, they're now sort of shadowing sessions and we're hopeful that they're going to become our future leaders long into the future, along with giving us a platform and a template to roll out this program next year and help 10 more young people who then can add to the capacity of the organisation. So that's what we're hoping our internal legacy from that program is. But in terms of the wider legacy, again, sort of, echoing um, the comments before, we, we just hope that isn't an afterthought. Um, I attended a session, a talk where the Commonwealth Games and legacy was often used by providers or organisers as a, almost a capture mechanism, as a buzzword to get the Commonwealth Games to a particular area. And then once it landed, there wasn't any strong or hard targets around legacy. So I hope that isn't the case in this instance, um, but there are some of the hallmarks emerging around maybe it was just an after four. And by that, I mean, we've got Alexander Stadium, beautiful, um, beautiful stadium, which it would have been pleasing to see as soon as the Commonwealth Games finished. There's a, a whole, he, whole, 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 a whole heap of activity taking place around Alexander Stadium. But from what I know, it's pretty much closed off to the public and no one's able to access it. So we're hoping that doesn't go on for too long. And um, we've got a unfinished af what was to be the athletes village which i don't know if anyone's actually occupying that village or that that site at the minute so again that's disappointing um, but there are some impressive construction that's been placed around alexander stadium the perry bar area so we're just hoping that it does lead to some legacy from a regeneration perspective but certainly from an activities and building that community affinity and spirit i think we're still yet to see some of that emerge Thanks, Dan. And I think that's a perfect segue into the, the next conversation, really, when we think about the wake of the Games. You mentioned some of the legacy programmes like Gen 22 and how that's starting to work for you as an organisation. Nassim, for you, is there anything in terms of those legacy activities that you were really feeling is going to make a difference moving forwards? Um, I'm going to answer the first question first because um, that's what I wanted to do. So I'm going to just be honest, the buzz around Birmingham was amazing. I'm a proud Brummie, as I said. I loved it. Uh, I loved the impression that, not the impression, but that breaking of that concrete collar impression people have of Birmingham. Seeing Mike Bushell every morning, the sun helped, by the way. So it always looked amazing and beautiful. Uh, I love the fact that there was more women who won medals. Um, it was the most successful games, we keep being told. But for whom? Uh, and more importantly, we created 2,000 jobs. But the board wasn't reflective of the community. And only when it was called out did it notice that it wasn't reflective. Um, the workforce wasn't reflective of the community it was serving. They had no connections in communities, with groups, with organisations. And certain groups, I'm sure, around this table, we knocked on doors, sent emails, and really we didn't get the kind of response that we um, should have got because we were trying to help. It was built on bringing diversity to this city, and it didn't do it. Um, the other things I must say is that, um, going back to workforce, the volunteer workforce, I actually had to knock on doors, had to find a connection in there to get um, the volunteering team out to explain about the volunteer roles. We've got over 25 women to volunteer. I volunteered myself because I felt if I don't ask... Um, if I ask all the other women to volunteer, then I should do it myself, and I did. 
I didn't see that reflection in the workforce uh, that were volunteering. In fact, I would go far as to say I barely saw a reflection of um, the communities that, serve this, uh, that live in the city. Um, so in relation to um, legacy, well, for me, the issue is quite simple. The legacy that, the money that went round, how are we meant to use five, six thousand pounds to tackle inequality that's decades old? How are we going to use five or six pounds, six thousand pounds to tackle inequality in physical activity, in sports provision? In most communities, Walsall Heath, there's no such thing as a youth centre. There never has been, and the way things are, there never will be. So I think for me, I, sorry to answer the first question first, but to me, I'm not going to sit here and make excuses. I'm going to tell you the truth, because for as long as I can remember, um, it's great to build partnerships, but if you don't tell the truth, nothing changes. When we think about legacy as a sector -wide context, in a sector-wide context, what do you think the opportunities that we have are when you, when you share your experiences of what, you've see, what you saw, what you felt, what you heard? What do you think the opportunities are for us now to really build a legacy from the Games? Yep, I'll do it quickly. Um, so for me, there are organisations and groups that have been around for decades, and they really make an impact, but it's local. Uh, more importantly, we are doing the job that many people should be doing, whether it's the local authority, whether it's different um, sectors for health. We are making that impact. We are tackling those um, issues, that are the wicked issues, the ones that nobody tackles. And it's really about making the connections and having honest relationships and forging relationships. What we get is the lastminute.com. We've got 20 tickets to wherever. And that's not really how it should be. There should be a way of having clear communication, clear understanding, relationships. Every organisation, I could sit here and say, I'm competing with Tom, but I'm not. Because actually what Tom does is amazing and where he does it, way, the way he does it is amazing. I don't do that. I do something completely different. But other people might see it as we're competing. We're not because Birmingham is big enough for at least two Toms, three Toms. And it, Birmingham's big enough for more than just my organisation working with ethnic minorities on one side of the city. So I think it's really about making the connections, building the relationships, but more importantly, being honest with what we can or can't achieve together. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my point on this, I think there is an opportunity, but I've, I've long, for a long time said um, there's a real issue um, and I think there's a constant churn for, every, for the longest time that I've been involved in sports development and, and running my own community interest company, there's a constant churn of short-term investment for what are long-term, deep-rooted issues within our communities. And what it does need is long, more long-term and larger investment into community organisations, particularly community organisations that are well-established, have demonstrated a long track record and have impacted countless lives on a shoestring budget prior to that. Um, so I think whether it's the trust, the confidence, there needs to be some form of step change with large funding providers and investors to have the confidence in local organisations that are talented to really say, actually, yes, we're going to fund you for projects and programmes, which you all know then leads to a numbers game and leads to organisations competing against each other for the, for, for the funding and for the numbers. But maybe it's looking at, actually, we're going to give you that long-term security, that long-term ability and time to develop your organisation, its infrastructure, and then ultimately employ more local people, employ more young people and provide employment pathways without organisations constantly looking behind their back of when they next need the, the next round of funding. Organisations have that long-term outlook to then look at how they can be sustainable in their own right into the future. So that's where I think we've got a massive opportunity to really make that influence and change. I also feel as though it's an opportunity with the amount of credible organisations and local groups to really work together around facility hire or around some sort of facility development and almost have a shared space because for me, there's a massive issue in Birmingham around facilities and around there's a massive facility shortage. In respect to sport, I've always thought that sport works in its silos. Yeah, you have a number of associations out there, but we work separately, we do. Yes, we're majorly focused on basketball. You were doing a lot more than, than just basketball. And so we've started to look at how we work with other sporting organisations in, in this city. But it goes back to what Mark said. It's not just about money. Yeah, it's about true support. I'll tell you, because I've sat on a number of these 
big organizations when we're talking about gun crimes and organized crime groups and all of that. But I will tell you, the vast majority of people who sit on them don't go out and see the people that are doing the work. And that's the awful bit. Because only then will you know how you will spend that money sensibly. And, and I've been and looked at all of, all of that stuff as well in a, in a professional sermon I was a copper. How, will it, how does it work? Well, <clears throat> the conversation that we're having today, it will be good to see really what comes out of this and what organisations are involved because City Birmingham Basketball Club or City of Birmingham Rockies Basketball Club, we, all the money that we get, we get ourselves. We don't see it from other organisations. We apply for funding and all of that. Sometimes get it, sometimes don't. But we're not working together as sport. We do have Sport England. They supported us with regard to basketball. But it's about how you bring the whole sporting community together to work. We have three sixth form academies. One at an elite level and two others uh, because we're trying in basketball to probably work it out like the Americans do in terms of the college system. But we've got, in those uh, organisations, 45 kids that will come out of it at some point with a degree. But what will happen to them, and this is because of the nature of the way the UK runs is, they'll get their degree, they'll go to these colleges, and they'll end up playing everywhere else but Britain. I'm telling you. So we need sport to understand itself first, because, and I'm on about sport, because we don't. And that's what I see. And remember this, and I'll finish on this. The boy that brought home the basketball gold, he came from us. He came from Rockets. And he was a kid that had nothing, didn't know where he was going to go and what he was to do. And that's important. You know what? Him and indeed a lot of the other boys who are playing professionally across the world. We've got a great women's program now. They're 5-0. and oh, Yeah, right. But what I will say is this. How do you bring them back? Invest in us. Not just in terms of money but true support, because that way, honestly, the public purse will free up itself. And one last thing, think of the corporate context. Businesses out there are not supporting the very games that they go and watch because they can afford it. So it's up to all of us to bring them in. Thank you. So we've, we've talked legacy, we've talked um, kind of activities, challenges, opportunities but almost a $64,000 question. If we're to continue to learn and learn from previous events, what needs to change or what needs to be done better moving forwards? Um, in terms of what needs to change or be done better, I've already outlined some of the challenges and opportunities, but I think ultimately it's just working together as an ecosystem. I think, as I've alluded to before, that organisations, particularly locally rooted organisations, need to be invested in um, a lot more to, to be able to create these thriving ecosystems within their community that, yes, run activities and programs, but actually employ people and then give young people opportunities, paid opportunities, not just come and play and be active and then go back to being on the roads, essentially, for not being able to find a better word. Um, so I really think we need to look at that. I, only, I also think the strategic partnership system needs to have a look at that. And ultimately, whether intentionally or purposely in some cases, recognise that sometimes there is a gatekeeper function there where it's all that old analogy teach a man to fish where I think a better job can be done to teach some of these smaller organizations how to operate how to develop their governance that puts them in a far better position into, for the future that they no longer need to be a gatekeeper whether that's intentionally or, or, or inten unintentionally so I think that needs to be looked at but again it, it's us working together and truly for the strategic system to work to make themselves redundant because ultimately the, the, the local organisations started from a place of passion in the community and running their, their activities on a shoestring budget. And guess what? When all of the sectors been and gone, they'll still be there doing the same work with or without the funding, essentially. So there's, there's things that we all need to look at as, as an organisation, as a collective ecosystem, essentially. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so for me, um, I'm going to echo some of your points, which is, uh, we need to cut out the middle men and women um, who get commissioned, large contracts, and then ask you and me to get them their numbers. And we have to do it on a quarter of the cost. 
So cut out the middle people, cut out some of the funding in relation to NGBs. I really learned how to make myself popular. Um, <laughs> but cut out NGB funding unless they actually achieve those targets. Um, and the other thing I've recently been doing is challenging them, which is when they come and ask me, can you do a summer program? I just say, no, I'm no longer going to do that. I'm not, no longer going to sit on that wheel, keep going around, and actually the nothing changes for the community. So I've asked for people to work with us for the long term. I want to ask them to help us to tackle the long-term inequalities. I'm actually asking them to stop giving me £5,000, £2,000. I'm not interested in it anymore. It's a long-term commitment. It's about legacy. If we want to sustain things, the biggest way to sustain things is to train up local people. So in my field, how many women do you think are sports, co sports coaches? Let me tell you, the only organisation that does that is us. We develop support, nurture, help them volunteer, and we don't ask them to keep on volunteering. Why should I ask the poorest communities to keep on volunteering for free? I just don't agree with that model, and I know people don't like that, but I'm going to be very straight and say, I'm not going to help people to get experience, to volunteer, and then stay a volunteer. Because they're not white middle class. They're not on 120,000 a year. They're not going to be happy to keep on giving two hours every single week. Why should they? And in fact, people on 100,000 a year don't do it for the whole year. Why should the poorest community? So if you really want to invest, you really want to see changes, then you have to invest in the training, development of local people, local coaches, women, ethnic minorities. That's how you're going to see change. Um, the other thing is stop making us compete with each other. Commission us. You know what we do. You know what we can't do. Stop making us compete with each other. I don't want to do what Tom does. He doesn't want to do what I do. But if you know what we want to achieve and it fits in with what you need to do, then commission us. Um, and then again, go to the communities that are where it's needed the most. Make sure you filter that funding to where it's needed the most because that's how you're going to make the long-term impact. Because you're not... You, if I... Think about the 3,500 women we work with. And I think about saving at least, oh, I don't know, five women from a triple bypass. We've paid for our organization's cost in that year. And yet, what about the 3,450, can't do the maths anymore, women that we've worked with? You know, so it's about how we utilize the funding, how we work out the cost benefit and analysis, but more importantly, how we change the system from trying to cure people to prevent people from getting ill. Uh, in my neighbourhood, at, at the age of 75, is the national average, 72 Birmingham. In the neighbourhoods that I work with, it's 65 if you're lucky for males. So we need to start working on how we prevent people being ill rather than paying for long-term illness and long-term tablets, injections, etc. So sport is brilliant for health, well-being, uh, and um, mental health. We take uh, kids from five years old all the way through to our club to all the, the senior level. Sport has so much to offer, but I agree with Nassim. It's not about making us fight against each other for a small pot, of which is not gold. Because what happens in the end is that you do what myself and some of you will know Rob Palmer. Rob is the guy that started all of this. And how hard Rob works to do it. I'm lucky I'm on a pension, you know, one of those gold-plated things. So I can give of my time. But Rob, who is working within it, if I was to say to you that that boy is doing 16 to 18 hours a day, I am not lying for the hundreds of kids at that club. So we have to look, keep our eyes out for everything. But more often than not, we will look at some of these processes and say, forget it. It's too hard. It will take too much time to do it. And at the end of it, we won't know what we will get if we indeed get anything. It's about communication and it's about working with each other. As sports organisations and the NGBs, everybody seems to be looking after number one we've decided to go down that route of getting involved with others to see what we can do. And, I, and I'm going to reiterate what I said before. The one group that is really missing from all of this, and that is out there in the commercial world, massively missing. So we need the NGBs, we need the organisations, the Quangos, whatever, to get into them as well. 
because as I say, they're the people that can afford those tickets to go and see the internationals. They can afford the tickets to go from here to South Africa, to New Zealand, to watch the rugby. I say that because my boy plays. Right. But the problem is, it's the kid that comes into your club that can't afford it, but has to sneak through the door to get in. Then you have to think about how many bursaries that you're going to give out, and then all of a sudden, you're swamped with it. Who supports us? Well, we don't. We have to take the hit. And like this morning, and like 11 o'clock last night, the first thing this morning, I've got a CEO who's thinking about how are we going to get through the next year. If we'd had one of those commissions with a reasonable amount of money, perhaps we could, but we have to fight for whatever little money we get because most of the people that are out there that are using your organisations can't truly afford it. Thanks all. I think that concludes our session and I think just to, to, to really kind of retort what I'm hearing from the, the conversations this morning are around openness and transparency at all, at all levels of the system across the board. But I think probably rounding that off with what I'll call the three C's which I was hearing which were very much connectedness. Um, collaboration and communities. I think the local vibe that was coming through feels absolutely at the heart of everything that we're trying to achieve and that's probably the only way that we're going to move things forward. So thank you everybody for your contributions um, and I think we're, we're closing there, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, I'll, see you. I'll, I'll leave that there for the next one. Thank you guys, that was fantastic. Um, I'm quite mindful of I was gonna, making sure we give uh, plenty of opportunity for different voices in the room and online. So our next uh, session is going to be the, the policy perspective. Um, but I'm also very conscious after that we're going to be about 10, 15 minutes then and we're going to go into the breakout session. Because I know there's Daryl from In Chamber and Wolverhampton. There's Wolverhampton Wrestling Club and I'm from Wolverhampton. Uh, Hitesh is from West Bromwich, but we'll, we'll get past that. Um, so if we've got 10, 15 minutes, we're going to invite Inez Brown from the Institute of Directors in the West Midlands, who's going to come up, and she's going to oversee this panel. We've got uh, Mike Chamberlain from Sport Birmingham. Mike. Um, Matt Stone from the West Midlands Violence Reduction Partnership. It says unit there, Matt, I'm sorry, but apparently it's partnership now, isn't it? Yeah. I work with words and I get them wrong all the time. There you go. And uh, Dr. Verity, Verity Postlethwaite from University of Manchester. Where are you, Verity? Wonderful. So over to Inez. Thank you very much. You just heard Simon say that I'm from the Institute of Directors, and I think it was Kirk that mentioned earlier that you need to start engaging with the business community I invited um, Jeff to speak at a Commonwealth business conference that I organised for the business community in um, July, j just before the Commonwealth Games. And when I listened to what he had to say, I want to do more with the um, sports sector. And I'm going to be working with Jeff and Janice on, at the Youth Charter. So it's, it is really important that we collaborate. So you've already been introduced to our panel. Um, want to say welcome to Mike. Thank you for agreeing to um, speak, Matt, and also um, Dr. Verity. We are pleased that you're here with us. So can you just um, tell the audience your background? Give us, um, tell us about the organization that you work for, also what your area of expertise is in the field of sport and what you want to get from this town hall meeting? Well, all in 90 seconds. No, uh, no actually, take, a, take your time. Or I've less only got than that. Two. Um, yeah, morning, everyone. Um, well, I'm here because if Jeff asks me to do something, I, I, I tend to do as I'm told. Um, and it's been a pleasure working with Jeff uh, and the youth charter over the last year or two, but I'll come to that a little bit afterwards. Uh, and great to see so many friends and, and colleagues in the room. Um, so Sport Birmingham, and I'm from Wolverhampton, by the way, just to add to that little black country thing. Um, so Sport Birmingham is obviously the active partnership for this area, part of 40, a network of 43 active partnerships covering England. Uh, along with many colleagues in the room, we're part of um, a new defined system partner 
So I guess listening to some of the previous panel, you get a sense of responsibility because the, the language of you, and I take that responsibility seriously, as I know Mark and others do, that we have that responsibility to make more of a difference, uh, leave a more investment and, and offer greater support to anyone delivering sport and physical activity. And that's sort of, in a nutshell, our role. Uh, we're part of that system partner investment. We're blessed with five years of that, and we're only six months in. So the opportunity for us to work more collaboratively, we can do a lot better together. Uh, and I think the investment does absolutely give us the chance and the change that the competitive sort of look and feel of investment in the past has produced. We are already, through the legacy uh, and through the, uh, through the last year or two, working much more, talking much more together, and I absolutely believe that will pay dividends, uh, and, and I think we all carry that responsibility very seriously. Um, I can't remember all the questions you asked, so what, that's a what little do you bit want of a to start. Get out of today's, um, I um, think starting today, it's just a reminder, isn't it, of how important it is to make the time to talk. Um, I know talking needs to lead into action, but we haven't seen or spent enough time together um, exploring and jointly sort of challenging some of these difficulties. And the flow down of scraps of funding, which I hear all the time from the amazing organizations who, who work like the three panelists and many hundreds more. There's frustrations, there's anger, there's a recognition that they can do so much more to be part of the solution uh, and improve lives, uh, especially as Nazim emphasized where inequalities are greatest. Um, it's frustrating when you know you can do more, but you're limited, your hands are tied. Um, we have a responsibility as the active partnership along with others to help deliver more, help route more funding, and, and part of that capacity building with the workforce that's been mentioned. It takes hundreds, thousands of, of good people who give way beyond, um, but they shouldn't, as Nazim said, they shouldn't do it for free, shouldn't be expected from a volunteer workforce who have tough lives uh, and are deserved of a, a suitable um, payment for their, uh, for their work. So I guess it's just for me connecting more and, and committing to do so as we go through um, the legacy work. I'll shut up because I talk too much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Stone from the Violence Reduction Partnership. It used to be called the VRU. But we discovered that actually um, we, need to, we need to be working in partnership with other organizations, um, those like you who work on the ground, but also those who influence policy, but also those who um, work in education, um, those who work for organizations like Birmingham Children's Trust, um, the police. Um, so our whole remit is we believe that violence is preventable, um, not inevitable. Um, and how do we do that? We look at the causes of violence. We look at why people are involved or get exploited into violence, into criminal activity. Um, and so with that, as you can imagine, everyone here has a role to play in that. Um, everyone outside has a role to play. And so it's our role to ensure that they have that role and that they're doing that role in the best way possible. Um, so we've been a partnership for um, not even three years. Um, and, and unfortunately, each year that we um, exist, our funding gets um, smaller and smaller. Um, so we are... Um, starting from early years um, to try to impact young people from as young as possible, um, to try to stem them from a life of um, possible crime, violence, um, exploitation, grooming. Um, so we have a sports theme as part of the Violence Reduction Partnership uh, because we understand that sport is one of many ways that we can ensure that young people um, are being supported, um, have that wraparound, um, and so I'm, I'm here. My role is um, not sports. However, um, I have a team who focus on sports. Um, and I know that Aaron is here, um, from, who used to work for the uh, VRU as well. He knows a lot about what, what we're trying to achieve as a unit and as a team. Um, so I think I'll stop there for now. Um, I've written a lot of notes um, in response to questions. I will be coming with the responses from a kind of violence prevent, prevention theme. So I do apologise if I'm not talking about sport all the time, but I do believe that actually if we're talking about the whole system approach and the public health approach, then we have to consider all angles in this as well. So thank you.
Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Verity, um, and I have a PhD in sport legacy. So I stupidly, about 10 years ago, started to look at events from a very academic perspective. Um, but I've sensibly now become part-time. So I'm part-time in higher education and academia, and then part-time self-employed and volunteering in and around the sports sector. Um, why I'm here today is partly to sort of represent uh, what can often be a critical friend voice, but be accountable as an academic partner in all of these discussions. We've heard as it's a mixed economy ecosystem, um, and there's a number of academics in the audience as well, uh, so I'll be interested to hear some perspectives later in the day. Um, I'm also here representing uh, the UK Sport Development Network, um, which recently hosted its annual uh, convention at uh, Leeds Beckett University, and it was all around sport and social justice. So thankfully, there's a few familiar faces in the audience that were there. Uh, Hitesh and Simon were there, and we're looking to work more closely with um, the coalition um, to make sure that universities write glossy reports, but also higher education is in and around the table when it comes to some of these delivery questions. Um, not only uh, have I got an experience academically, I'm also actively doing research on the Commonwealth Games uh, as an event, but also as a movement. Uh, we've not really heard too much today about that sort of international client being the Commonwealth Games Federation, the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, and also this is the seventh time that the UK has hosted the Commonwealth Games. Um, so Manchester uh, is, is now nearly 30 years on. Uh, Glasgow has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, so I'm working on a couple of research projects that looks a little bit beyond Birmingham and the local regional partners and looks more at that international side of things. Um, so what I want to get out of today is to be a critical friend voice, um, but also uh, to hopefully see if we can ask some of the similar questions. There's been a lot of similar responses and thoughts today, but whether to see if the, the right questions are being asked to the right people. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, we know that Sport for, for Development has a very big voice, and how can they use that voice to um, strengthen the relationship between legacy from this event, its aims, and also sporting infrastructure in the community? How do you think that they can do that? It's a big question, so whoever wants to tackle it first. Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly start and then um, pass the mic over to, to Mike and Matt. Um, I think we've already mentioned this this morning, and this will not really come as any surprise, but the responsibility side of things, um, we're seeing in sort of the discipline of events and academically that more and more communities um, need to be embedded from the uh, beginning decision making. So that is even the bidding process. Birmingham was unique. Uh, as they weren't due to host, it was quite last minute, it then took on a pandemic context. We've had a number of different uh, national governments in that, that time period. Um, so I think my reflections on the strength of the voice is that the coalition and the communities need to be embedded from the decision making from the start. So should we even host an event like this. Referendums happen in events around the globe um, continually. Um, that's why the likes of the International Olympic Committee and other national federations and international federations are struggling to find communities that want to host these events as they don't often deliver for community benefits. Um, so I would say decision making from the start and that voice needs to be present at the table from the start. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I kind of want to encourage is for sport organisations to be used more than sport. Um, so, for example, in the Commonwealth Games, we use sport organisations to act as sh chaperones um, in and around the um, Commonwealth Games, like kind of the main stadium um, near the uh, Arena Academy, um, because we realise actually sport organisations are very good at engaging and they're very good at um, kind of building rapport with young people. So we thought, actually, instead of finding new organisations or just youth workers, let's think about how we can use sport organisations who have really, really well-trained staff who understand the engagement piece to be used and to um, empower them to be more than just thinking in their sport box. Um, so I think I want to try and push that a little bit more. Um, I think I, I totally agree with you around getting that voice. I think getting the youth voice... Um, into this work as well is very important um, in terms of ensuring that they are part of the decisions that get made. Um, I think one of the things that we're working on, again, with the Birmingham Children's Trust is around 
um, training youth, youth inspectors to inspect youth provision across Birmingham. So like, they will be the people who then will have the keys to say, actually, we feel that you're a suitable um, provision, a suitable service for young people across Birmingham. So we want to be able to empower them to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, definitely a huge question. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to Mike. Thank you. Yeah, I think it is important to remind ourselves that you know the games came to Birmingham late, um, and then we had COVID. <laughs> so yeah, the fact that, as, as Tom said, there was a there was eleven fantastic days put on. That was the primary role of the organising committee. And yes, there were some uh, there were some own goals, um, which Jeff, amongst others, challenged, and were part of improving that diversity of uh, of, of some of the governance. Um, but actually, the, um, there wasn't enough time to do everything really well. Um, and the commitment and the intent was there from, from the organizing committee around legacy and around involving some of the community. The reality of that was, with the best will in the world, lots of things happened separately and weren't as joined up. And I, and I think that's um, not making excuses for, for anyone, but I think it's just the reality of... Time was against us, um, and the times were difficult when we weren't as connected together. Uh, and an example of that was, you know, getting out the community roadshows. You know, Alton's here and colleagues in there. There was there was there was good work done engaging the community, um, and then there were separate community events, part of our separate funding through Sport Birmingham through the council. And of course, in an ideal world, all that would be joined up, and there would have been a greater connected visibility pre games. The funding for Legacy came in really late and was pretty minimal. And Sport England had to work very hard with DCMS to secure the funding that we ended up with for Legacy. And it's quite right that community organisations were saying, I haven't seen anything. Uh, the, the games is going on, I hear the news, but I haven't seen anything in my patch where I'm working. Um, and that can't be defended. What I would say is just to say on the positive side of things, we have got what I think is uh, a reasonable level of additional funding that is targeted into Birmingham. And all of that targeted work, all of that targeted funding will go to those most inactive and most deprived areas of the city, as it will in other areas of the West Midlands Combined Authority geography. And some of the Birmingham Council's further investment will go, well, it will all go into those similar areas and, and it will last for another year. So as far as I see, it's connected with the investments, the further six million or so into governing bodies, many of which are prioritizing Birmingham. We've sort of got in the region around about 10 million or so. Now, that still is a fraction of what we need for the issues that we're here and want to challenge and, and overcome. But it's a start. And, and the, the use of, you know, that being a catalyst for us all working more purposely together, our work as part of that Sport England investment with Jeff and Janice as the Youth Charter, creating and launching only a number of weeks ago the Birmingham Community Campus uh, as a model and a platform to hopefully try and connect digitally as well as, um, as, well as us, you know, finding the time together is an opportunity. And we will test that and we will use it and we will hopefully gather our collective impact more strongly. And to Kirk's point, the money is not going to come, the sufficient money is not going to come through grant funding. It's not going to come through, um, through Sport England, through lottery. Um, the commercial sector is the untapped sector. Uh, and that is something that we're minded of with partners in terms of demonstrating our collective impact much better. Um, and then the workforce development through the social coach program and lots of work that other partners are doing. I think we can just, there's a, there's a, there's a massive opportunity because of the games for us to demonstrate how well we can come together. We're not competing anymore. We recognize that we're past that. And we need to be mature about that and carry that responsibility forward. There is a major events group that I and a few colleagues are part of. And it is saying Birmingham can't just react and pick up the pieces that Glasgow or London or Manchester don't want. The leader of the council chairs that group. Lots of the right people are on that group by virtue of them representing the major venues. The group is nowhere near diverse enough. 
It is not representative of Birmingham, and the group needs to reach out to the community voice to be able to inform it of which sort of events we want here, not just the ones that we've had in the past that will have uh, another few years on a contract to run. What does the community want? What are those events that will make a difference? Uh, Jeff and I and others have talked about a youth games, a resurrection perhaps of something from a long ago, the Birmingham Youth Games. But this is not just about Diamond League Athletics and a few international events. The major events group needs to be influenced positively. And then the legacy conversation, as Verity said, will start at the pre-bidding stage and not just a couple of weeks back from the event as has happened years back when it's, oh, can we just engage a few schools? Can we do a bit of, quotes, legacy work? It's influencing right from the start and firstly asking, what do we want here? It might not be those sports. Do those sports resonate with the communities that, uh, that we work with? So there's a lot to do, but I am confident that some of the, some of the starting points are, are being made. Thank you. We have about three minutes, so I'm going to give you a minute each to um, answer this question. What specific role can the coalition um, play in bridging the divide between policy and practice? And we'll use um, open goal framework as an example. Um, so kind of like looking into what the open goal is, seeing um, the kind of three uh, kind of like, I suppose, themes was around um, fairness, equity and sustainability. Um, so I really believe if we're talking about legacy, then we need to talk about sustainability at the same time. Um, so I think there's probably those who are a little bit well better versed to kind of um, speak on that more than me. But um, I think, you know, things, um, things like, um, so for example, you may have a young person who lives on one side of the city and you may be an, an organisation who does a lot of um, sports, you have matches across the city. Are you thinking about the context of what that may look like for that young person going into one side of the city to another um, and how do we ensure that sports or organisations are thinking about that, are being trained in that and are taking that on board as well. Um, so I think, you know, there's those who we work with who I think through the work that we do, um, we ensure that they have that context around that because that's really important. Um, so could, could we repeat the question again? Yes, the question was, how will the, what specific role will the coalition um, be able to do to bridge the divide between policy and practice? And yeah. we were using open goal um, framework as an example. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I really think to ensure that, um, you know, what, what we're trying to achieve here is going to be long term. Um, I think we need to ensure that there's, um, going to be a constant, constant meetings about this, constant thoughts and feelings. Um, I suppose people who, as I think Dan said, those who may have been working here for a long time, um, who may not be getting the support or the funding that they need, but actually have an idea of what is needed to sustain this. They need to be involved in this conversation. Um, it's great to see a lot of people here, but I know there's a lot more who probably should be here as well. Thank you. Uh, in, in one minute, um, I think that the coalition specifically can shield and embrace incredible amounts of policy turbulence. We're talking as though policy is continuous. We're talking as though policy is something that is tangible. It, it is... Um, been an interesting five years or so in terms of what policy is and what that means then for the sports sector, for the events sector, for the local government sector. Um, so I think the coalition can go a long way in, in shielding and embracing and translating some of that policy turbulence into the organisations that are sat in front of us about how you continue to deliver, how you secure that long-term investment how you strengthen those collaborative moments and pushing back uh, when policymakers um, and those at the macro and the meso level are asking for things or wanting things that are just making people far too busy. And that's not just the paid workforce, but the volunteer workforce as well. We need to protect those on the front line. And I think the coalition can go a long way to do that. Thank you. I think in the way we've split policy and practice today, there's, there's not a divide anyway. It's, there's not an us and them in the room. Um, yes, those delivering, I, I've felt it more, um, especially the last couple of years. But 
we're talking about uh, bigger policy. We, 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 I want to see us as part of the same system, which is the coalition. Um, there's definitely not an us and them here, as I see it. We carry that responsibility as other national partners and other system partners to work more closely, invest wisely um, through insight and through the relationships we have with community delivery organisations. But that in itself isn't going to do it. So the coalition and, and us together needs to find a way to demonstrate a bigger impact to get longer-term investment and for policymakers at top level to invest significantly and seriously in the preventative agenda because we're not short, we're not short of evidence. What we haven't been able to do is influence in long-term prevention as far as, I, as far as I see it. Thank you all for taking part in today's panel. And the takeaway from this section is we hear collaboration again, that we need to come together, work together, sustainability. And this can only work if we all share our ideas, educate each other, and also speak to, um, you know, local authorities, but in particular, the commercial sector that can help us to achieve what we want to need for these young people, for the children, and also young adults who um, will be able to gain benefit through sports and the arts. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Sarah Mortaboys, um, and I work with Premiership Rugby, looking after their community development. And I'm here now to move you at pace through our, our next session. Um, and welcome to colleagues online as well. So this is really about you now having the opportunity to talk openly. Um, and as, as uh, Beverly said earlier, one of the, my favorite words in our language is be a bit maverick um, in the conversations that you're going to be having as you move around the room. Um, so I do have some very esteemed colleagues who are going to help facilitate these, uh, these conversations. Um, so question one, uh, which is with Simon, uh, Simon give us a wave over in the back, um, is really about how we raise um, the awareness and amplify the com uh, contribution of sport for development as a part of, of legacy and major event development and delivery. Um, my colleague James... Where's James? There he is, James, um, who's going to be over here on question two. It's really about who should be the key beneficiaries of social legacy programs and how do we ensure that we're collectively reaching these groups effectively. Um, Kelly at the back um, from the coalition um, will be looking at how we can work together to measure and report uh, the contribution of sport for development organisations, both around major events and elsewhere across our, our sector and beyond. Um, and Justin from Sporting People um, will We'll be looking at a, a subject that's very close to all of our hearts, which is really around workforce development um, and what we need to do to support the workforce um, across sport for development to enable them to meaningfully contribute. And you'll probably know as well that sporting people are working in partnership with the coalition um, around really getting under the skin of what's needed across workforce development. And Justin will be able to give you more information um, when you talk with him about a survey that's currently live for you really to have your voice um, and get things understood and to the forefront of that agenda. So what I'm going to do is move you. You've got the opportunity now and um, colleagues online are uh, James from Park Run and Julie from the Youth Sport Trust will be facilitating this online as well. So you have the opportunity over the next 10, 15 minutes or so, and I will make sure that I bring you back in um, to really pick a couple of those questions um, and go and visit each station, um, pick a couple of those questions and really get under the skin in terms of the conversations that, that you need to have. So um, I'll send you off now. So as I say, move around the room um, and I'll bring you back and, and keep you on track. Thank you, guys. So, uh, thank you very much. 
um, colleagues for participating so fully in that session. And thank you very much to colleagues online as well. We're now going to go into our, our last closing session of the day. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, Jeff Thompson um, and Jeff, uh, esteemed colleague, um, Deputy Chair of Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games and founder and executive director of the Youth Charter. Um, and also to introduce Hitesh Patel, um, who is executive director of the coalition. Over to you. Sarah, Sarah, thank you. Um, I thought that was a, a great session. Um, it seemed to be a morning sprint session. I think going forward, we might have to make it an all-day marathon session to try and sort of cram in all the various interesting uh, discussions. So I'll try and keep it short because I am conscious that Jeff and I are keeping you all from lunch and probably trains back to wherever you've journeyed from. Um, but some of you do know me. Some of, uh, some of you will have kind of come across me in my previous guise before I joined the coalition in April this year when I worked at DCMS. Um, I was in government for 20 years as a civil servant. 17 of those years were in DCMS, 12 of which were working on sport, leading on um, international sport, uh, major sports events, not specifically the Commonwealth Games, I must add, um, although I did sit on the internal um, delivery board. Um, and also integrity, that's things like anti-doping, match-fixing, anti-corruption uh, and governance, all the kind of high-profile, sometimes bad news stories. Um, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here in Birmingham and by extension the black country, as Simon mentioned at the outset, I'm originally from West Bromwich, um, he's from Wolverhampton and surprisingly we do get on. Um, and, and you know, it feels like being, being at home and, and maybe my accent might be, might be coming out a bit more. Um, I did hear Nassim say earlier on, I think she mentioned, was it B12? I think I have to say B70 probably rules for me. Um, but the coalition team were here for a couple of days during the games. And, and although we did see some sport, the main driver for being here was to see some of the wider community-related activity taking place. So Mark mentioned the summer, uh, the summer camp that took place that Street Games delivered out in Bromsgrove. We went along to that. Um, we went to, I can see Wills here from uh, YST. We went to the Youth Sport Trust House just down the road in Perry Bar. And I have to say, um, you know, Jeff's the deputy chair of Birmingham 2022, and I thought, you know, we're never going to get time with him while we're here for the Games. Um, you know, thinking that he'd be kind of, you know, flitting between one venue to the other, you know, chasing all the, the medals, you know, in his kind of chauffeur-driven car. But actually, um, we, were, we were granted, I thought it would be a one-hour meeting. Three hours later, we were, you know, we, we'd kind of talked about the genesis of today's town hall event. Originally, we were thinking about doing something prior to the Games, but we were quite clear as a team that we wanted to do something post games once the circus so-called circus has left town and um it was jeff's idea or suggestion to um host it here at the legacy center of excellence a venue which i hadn't heard of before surprisingly but what a great venue it is and you know i'll certainly be coming back here um not least because i saw on the website they also host concerts here so i'll certainly be doing did be doing that um but but there was and, and i think Nazim uh, mentioned it earlier on, there was certainly a vibe in the city during the games. And I don't know if it's because of the changing of the seasons or what, but, you know, I'm up in Birmingham, the black country, quite often. But, but you know, that vibe is kind of evolving and changing, and it's almost like we're back to business as usual. So I'm hoping very much that um, through today's event that some of you were able to kind of speak to each other for the first time. I noted that Beverly hadn't actually spoken to Tom from Sport for Life, uh, which was surprising. And I'm sure there are other kind of connections that we can help facilitate, if not here today, uh, certainly post-event. And the coalition's happy to kind of act as a dating agency, so to speak, in that regard. Um, but, but my lens into the world of Sport for Development uh, primarily was through Sport for Life, actually. Um, I'm the outgoing chair of Sport for Life. Um, and it's through the sport and employability route that, that gave me my lens into this world. Um, but, but this year, you know, I've been telling people whenever I, I see them that this is like the biggest sporting year um, that the UK has seen since 2012 when we hosted the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And, and if you remember back, back 
you know, going back 10 years, legacy was the word that was bandied around quite a lot. Uh, and it's being bandied around again uh, in the context of, you know, everyone agreeing that, you know, it's good to play more sport. Playing more sport is, is effectively the means. Everyone can agree on the means, but what people don't often appreciate is what the end goal is, what the end point is. And what I'm hoping and what we as the coalition are hoping through our open goal advocacy framework, and you'll remember the slide that Simon put up at the outset and it's on our website, um, it, it, all the different areas that, that, you know, sport can make a tangible and positive difference to. And, and when I first joined the coalition back in April, we did host a town hall event uh, in Manchester, which related to sport and criminal justice. Uh, that was delivered in partnership with Street Games and the Alliance of Sport. Um, six, six months on from that, um, you may have seen that, that it was announced last Friday that we'd managed to, as a consortium, the coalition working with Street Games and the Alliance of Sport, that, that we'd managed to secure £5 million worth of new funding from the Ministry of Justice to support interventions in the criminal justice system using sport. So, that's, you know, we're open to bids for that. So, so please go and have a look at details if you're interested on our website. And we, uh, Street Games and the Alliance of Sport, we're very happy to have con um, conversations around that. I can't guarantee that six months on from today's event that we'll manage to kind of elicit uh, some more funding from government, but certainly that's something we'll be trying. But the ground is fertile, I would say, in terms of, of where the government is and its arm's length bodies. So, for instance, some of you will be aware of Sporting Future, the government's sports strategy. My former colleagues at DCMS still intend to publish uh, a new strategy um, before the end of this year, although it might, might be early next. That's certainly something that Stuart Andrew, the new sports minister, has, has championed of late. Uh, Sport England continues to um, deliver and realise its um, uniting the movement strategy. Um, and UK Sport... Um, are also looking into the social impact of hosting major events, and I'm delighted that we've got Matt Wookie here from, from UK Sport today. Um, what I, want, I don't want to take up too much more time, uh, but I, I think I should sort of offer a round of quick thank yous before passing over to Jeff. Um, firstly, thank you to Jeff and Janice for, for uh, the support they've given in delivering today's town hall event. Um, Again, Keith and Janky and the team here at the Legacy Centre. Uh, thank you to all the presenters and facilitators and to you who've made the effort to come here in person and also to our online audience. Um, and, and significantly for me, thank, thank my team, um, notably Erin, who's online, uh, Simon, who's kind of helped design and, and driven this event to, through to today and also Kelly and my team who actually sadly is going to leave us for a great new role at Access Sport next week so we wish her well for that and, and my, my chair is here Andy Reid and uh, a couple of board members as well James Mapston is one of my board members and I think we've got another online as well um, and also our funders so Mike mentioned earlier on uh, the system partners of, of Sport England the coalition's a proud system partner of Sport England and we're also grateful for the funding and support we get from Comic Relief and, and Laureus um, and and without further ado I think I'll stop there and hand over to Jeff I'm hoping my voice will carry sufficiently enough not to need the use of a mic Possibly that comes from a competitive career where the warrior cry, which 40 years ago, on the 21st of November, saw me win my first two gold medals, along with another, just by way of clarification, and the executive director of the Youth Charter is Janice Argyle Thompson. This is for the interactively active and actively interactive, I'm told. But um, she is equally one of those incredible um, warriors who won gold in that silver and bronze medal hall 40 years ago. And I got the best return on my investment because she became my wife. But she has more importantly been equally the force behind the youth charter, which three decades on simply I think brings to an incredible journey now with this town hall meeting, a place and moment in time. 
Nassim said, if we don't tell the truth, nothing changes. I am absolutely driven by that telling of truth to power. Each and every one of us has that power. And I'm hoping on the ability to have been convening you here today that you will all take the responsibility for what that power represents. First, foremost, and uttermost with me sharing with you this fundamental human right and belief that sport in its artistic and cultural fundamental human right of opportunity to young people in their mental, physical, and emotional health and well-being. If we all agree on that, we will equally agree that then they're not afforded that fundamental right, the mental, physical, and emotional disaffection and disadvantage can lead to antisocial, gang-related activity, and extremism. That has an impact on all of society, inner city, suburban, or rural, upper, middle, and lower of whatever class suggests it is not a subcultural phenomenon. The bidding and hosting and legacy of major games is nothing new to Britain. We have been at it for a long time. Ironically, Birmingham had the aspiration of bringing the Barcelona games as they became awarded to Birmingham. It was my first exposure to the IOC and all things sport. Birmingham had been at this for a long time. In between that time, Manchester, which is where a legacy intention was shared and I was proudly to become an ambassador for that games. We lost the 2000 bid, but during the loss of that 2000 bid, we lost a young life on the streets of Moss Side, Manchester. His name was Benji Stanley. Please remember that name because without him and that loss of life, we would not be here today. That is for those who then do your due diligence. But from that, the business sector, the commercial sector, invested in what I simply wish to see on the basis of a royal charter, a youth charter. Manchester lost the 2000 Olympic bid, but gained the 2002 Commonwealth Games. It was the most equitably diverse and inclusive games, where para sport were given equal parity in the games program. What gave birth to the games makers came from going into areas of regeneration and renewal to give them a role as volunteers. But as the point has been well made, communities thrive because they come from the community, by the community, with the community. By the year 2000, at the 2000 Games, the late Kofi Annan and the late Dan Mary Glenn Haig, a founding trustee of the Youth Charter, had a conversation at the opening ceremony and Sport for Development for Peace was born with an office in New York. The Magdalene Conference in 2003 and following years started to set a global footprint. A movement was inspired. I have to share with you today, the Youth Charter's tragedy was seven years. I cannot believe it's become myself and Janice Argyle Thompson's life work for what many of you have now committed to. But if the truth be told, it has become a sector and now an industry. And that is fundamentally wrong. If the three pillars of engagement, of sport, art, culture, and digital activity, and it must be holistic, it must be integrated to engage young people, then it can equip them, as we all believe, with the mental, physical, emotional health and well-being and life resilience. Once they have that, they have to be empowered with an ambition of further higher education, employability, or entrepreneurship. Without that, it's failed. I've witnessed hundreds of millions of pounds, strategies, policies. I'm now serving my 10th prime minister in public life. I won't tell you how many sports ministers or secretaries of state. Suffice to say, like most say when they see me coming, they all say yes to me, but not many followed up. But that's not exclusive. Respective governments have failed. But I will share with you this. In every single moment where people have said, we need to talk, we need the round tables, we need the strategies, we need the agencies, they are not reflective of the communities we want to affect the change. It is not diverse, not just in look, in thinking, in creativity, knowledge, 
in collectivism. And I will revert back to the George Floyd moment because it's only when diversity comes together we can make something that's wrong right. As the deputy chair of Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games, they were charged to deliver a games. They delivered that games, an extraordinary games. It is not an organizing committee's role or responsibility to look at the issue that we are now empowered to deliver. I'm also on the London Legacy Development Corporation, 10 years on from 2012. That's why we didn't deliver the Pledge of Inspiring a Generation. You have to have the sport for development infrastructure. It used to be called community sport, by the way, for those of you who don't remember Action Sport and the Community Sports Leaders Award and sport for all for that matter. Denzine White has to, had to leave us, but as the chair of Sporting Equals, he equals a Wolvertonian from the black country. I always wanted to know why I was from the black country. I'm a lot more comfortable in my skin with that. That stereotypical label is afforded me. But isn't it ironic that we both having represented this country, both had something in common we just acknowledged and accepted and shared with Tesh. Both had sons that were not disadvantaged. They were disaffected because what society thought of them. Both went in the wrong direction. Both lost their, fri their, their friends to violence on the streets. Denzine's son went to the University of Crime. My son I shipped off to Germany just to save their lives. Denzine's confirmed that his son's now turned his life around. He now has a family and he has children. My son hasn't got a wife, hasn't got any children. Hope that doesn't happen for now because I'm not ready to be a grandparent. But he, win well, well, he will win a world title in his chosen combat sport of boxing. However, tennis was his love. And he said, Dad, they don't want me there. What I'm saying to you on the basis of where we are now and Birmingham 2022's mission aim of a games for everyone is with those games now ending we have a legacy movement that must redefine itself lincoln has been doing this work for the time i can remember i had the privilege um, to visit his project wolverhampton wrestling was zero kicks they're here kirk, kirk Dawes is a fellow warrior but why are they all having to make a case for resources have we not made one collective bid? Well, the Sport for Development Coalition has a framework. The Youth Charter has a model, a community campus model, and it reflects the sustainable development goals. The impact is now measurable. We weren't resourced, but that was not going to stop us. The Legacy Centre of Excellence hosted then a games engagement of job skills, because we needed employable, diverse, and reflective faces of Birmingham. One world in one city, 72 nations and territories. Bring the power, Generation 22, baton bearers, games changers, all contributed. But it's interesting to note, 14,000 volunteers from Birmingham. But Nassim is right. Was it reflective of all of those faces of Birmingham? No, it wasn't. Because those in the community didn't have the time, energy, or bandwidth. That's a truth. But no one will ignore the spirit of what was there. But the one thing I will employ you all today, if we don't make that coalition a consortium of genuine diversity in all of its forms, then the commitment means nothing. And I say to you this, if every life is priceless, I will send you the report that will make all of us look at ourselves. We are 54 lives lost on the streets of this country, inner city, suburban, or rural. Many say Jeff Thompson's angry, aggressive, makes them feel anxious. By the way, that, that energy was enough to lead a Great Britain team to dominate then, now. It cannot be good in one sphere and not acceptable in another sphere. I do thank George Floyd for being able to become the Deputy Chair of Birmingham 2022 because without his life being lost and that neck on that knee on his neck, I would not have had that role. That's a truth because there was challenge and it's good to challenge. It's good to be an activist. It's good to tell the truth to power because we do so on the basis that our young people 
need to know that there's someone prepared to fight their corner. We have a call to action. There is a plan. Ten prime ministers on. A number of more reports from the Children and Young People's Commissioner. And we've yet to see lives saved, not lost. Please work together. Mothers will hold us accountable. They're the ones who come to me when we talk about youth games. Let's have that youth games. A mother came up to me with a boy of only 15 to 16 years of age. He had four gold medals around his chest. She looked me straight in the eyes and said, I've done my due diligence. You're the chair of the London Youth Games. I can't feed him because he's eating me out of house and home. I can't afford the equipment to ensure he runs faster. But more importantly, when I send him to another borough in London, I'm looking to you when he doesn't come back. There is no way I intend to look at mothers or families that look like me, where I've come from, and tell them I'm sorry, because we didn't work together. There's an extraordinary opportunity. Birmingham 2022 did its job. United by Birmingham 2022 charity is aiming to continue that job, but there are others who are doing it, and we need to do it collectively. So the fight continues. Please work together. Coalition, consortiums, I don't care. Just let's get back to our communities. And by the way, this has always been done. That's what produced me and Denzine White and Mike Chamberlain. He's a warrior. You've got a number of combat sports in here. Maybe that's telling you something. Maybe we can challenge that aggression. I'm still in here talking to you rather than outside waiting for you. And filter that between your subconscious and conscious. Always gives you a slightly nervous feel. Ooh. Please. I'm exhausted. Why am I having to make a case? Alton, for your brother. <coughs> Too many lives lost whilst we faff around and go through strategies. From the community, by the community, with the community. A legacy center of excellence, a legacy opportunity for all. Please never apologize, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, sorry to bring a, a bit of a dampener on it. Uh, has anybody got a, a Ford in the car park? EJ13 ELV, your alarm is going off. Uh, but thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, we will be following up on all the actions uh, to Jeff and Tesh's points. Thank you very much. Um, so please look out for that. Thank you for your support today, for your attendance. And uh, please come and join us to have lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>